Hey, Grace Point, we are uh, just thrilled again to worship uh, together today. Thank you for joining us from where you are. Want to remind you to register today if you're going to be joining us next Sunday for services here at Grace Point. We thank you for registering because it helps us to be able to plan well. Also wanted to uh, let you know that a lot of our communication that comes from Grace Point to you is via email. And, and so just want to remind you, if you have in the past been receiving emails and, and you haven't been recently, please check your junk or spam folders uh, as those emails may be going there. Uh, we love communicating with you. We love connecting with you. And uh, again, thanks for joining us today as we continue uh, to uh, look forward to worshiping together. Uh, I want to read to you from Psalm. Psalm 136, and it says there, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. And later in the psalm, it, it says, It is he who remembered us in our lowest state, for his steadfast love endures forever. And uh, this psalm ends with just a great truth and hope for us. It says, Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's worship together. Worship our King. Come, let's bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great. Things. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the light, for oh, Jesus our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things.
became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. It's through the sacrifice of Christ that we can experience God's grace, his mercy. It's in Christ alone that our hope is found. In Christ alone my hope is strong, He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving ceases. I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the love of Christ I darkness lay then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip for me for I am his and he is mine bought with a precious blood God of amazing grace. Uh, thanks so much for worshiping with us uh, online. Uh, uh, I pray you're enjoying your holiday weekend here, the 4th of July, as we think about the freedom that we have as a country. I also just want to say uh, we're so we're praising God this morning for the freedom that we have, the freedom that's available to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer. So church, let's pray as we open up the scriptures this morning. Heavenly Father, we, uh, God, we want to praise you. God, we worship you this morning. Uh, you are a God of amazing uh, grace, uh, this amazing grace that has been poured out upon us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Father, um, would you be our teacher here this morning as we open up the scriptures? God, would you uh, reveal to us 
God, your beautiful truth here, even in this book of, of Ruth, as we work our way right through, God, your, your perfect word. So, Father, show us what we need to see today. Guide my words, I pray. Uh, we lift it all up to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, church, would you uh, open up those Bibles, please? Open your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3. Ruth 3, is this is where we're going to spend our time today. Uh, so, um, one of the things that I get to do as a pastor is uh, sometimes I have funerals and sometimes I have weddings that I will, will do. And whenever I'm planning for a wedding, one of the things that I love to do with a, with a couple as I'm doing some premarital counseling with them, we're kind of anticipating the wedding day. Uh, I'm, I'm working with them. I'm getting to know them. And one of the things I, I love to always ask them is, tell me about the proposal. Tell me about the proposal. Like, how did he propose to you? How did that go down? Just describe that to me. I love to hear that, that story uh, when uh, when. I asked Tamara to marry me. Uh, I took Tamara back, this was in Dallas, and I took her to a place called Turtle Creek Park. Turtle Creek Park was the place where we had our very first kiss. And so I took her back to that exact same spot uh, where that first kiss was, and I got down on one knee and I popped the question. I told her how much I loved her, and I said, Tamara, will you marry me and she said well let me think about it for a few days no no she said she said yes I mean she said yes I will marry you I mean what a great 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 day and you know today as we come to Ruth chapter 3 in our Ruth series we are going to read about and we're going to hear about a marriage proposal now in this marriage proposal I promise you it's not like your marriage proposal Uh, and uh, I'd say if you're not yet married if you're thinking about well maybe one day there will be a proposal in my future, I'm almost sure it's not going to go down like this. Okay, so we're going to see a really interesting marriage proposal in Ruth chapter 3 today. So listen, if, in case you're just sort of, you're just joining us, you're just sort of jumping in on this Ruth series, we're now in week 3, and I want to give you a really quick recap, okay, of like where we've been in this book to make sure we're all in the same spot as we turn to chapter 3. Chapter 1 really began uh, introducing us to the setting of this book. The book is set in the time of the judges. The judges was really a dark period in the nation of Israel. It's a time, as the Bible describes it, when everyone was doing what's right in their own eyes. Well, during this time, there's a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi, and there's a famine in the land of Israel, and so Elimelech takes his family, and they move to the land of Moab. Now, this is really, Moab is is adjacent to Israel, but it's really, they're enemies of Israel for sure. So it's a bit shocking that this man would leave Israel and move to Moab, uh, but he does it. And uh, while they're there, Elimelech dies and leaving Naomi a widow. However, Naomi has her two sons, Malon and Kilion, with her. Well, eventually those boys marry a couple of Moabite girls, uh, Orpah and Ruth. Well, we read in the Bible after 10 years, uh, both of those sons, they also die, uh, leaving Naomi and Ruth and Orpah as three widows. Now, Naomi is very, very broken, right? She is so um, uh, distressed. She, she believes that God is against her. Naomi is... Uh, She describes it as, I am empty. Uh, God has made my life bitter. Well, Naomi hears that there is now, the famine is over in Israel, and she decides, I'm going to return back to Bethlehem, where I'm from. And Orpah and Ruth go along with her. About halfway there, Naomi encourages those two girls. She said, girls, don't go back to Israel with me. Go back to your own families. Go back to Moab. Go back to your gods. Uh, It it is bitter for me. God is against me. In other words, Naomi is just so broken. She's like, I'm just damaged goods. I'm damaged goods. And so uh, Orpah does go back, but Ruth, the Bible says, Ruth clings to Naomi. Uh, Ruth makes this amazing uh, commitment of faith and love. And we read about that, Ruth chapter one, verse 16. I just wanna share it with you. It's, It's really beautiful. Ruth said to Naomi, she said, don't urge me to leave you. Don't urge me to return from following you for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. Ruth is really building this legacy of love and and faith here. However, Naomi, uh, where she is, she's just really building, I would say, a legacy of bitterness. So chapter one ends pretty hopeless pretty hopeless. Naomi and Ruth return back to Bethlehem, but chapter two could be called a new hope, a whole, a a new hope. We're introduced to a new person in the story, a new character, and his name is Boaz, and Boaz is described as a man of noble 
character. And uh, uh, it's very, very encouraging. We also learn about him. Not only is, a ma- is he a man of noble character, he is also a near relative. Uh, he is a near relative t- to Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. He's described as a kinsman redeemer. Uh, now, listen, not knowing Boaz at all, Ruth goes out to work in a field in order to glean the harvest, in order for them to have uh, some food to eat. And so Ruth happens upon the field of this man named Boaz. And Boaz uh, meets her. He notices her. Uh, It's a little bit of a love at first sight moment, perhaps. A little bit of a romantic connection there. He's like, who is that woman? He learns that this is Ruth, the Moabitess. Now, uh, he extends just real real, uh, love and grace towards towards Ruth. And uh, this is the way the Bible describes it. Ruth chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, as Boaz just shows great kindness to Ruth and encourages her to remain and and glean in his field, this is what she says. Uh, She fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to Boaz, well, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, listen, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and your mother and your native land, and you came to a people that you did not know before, Uh, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. A full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Well, uh, because of Boaz's kindness, Ruth uh, returns home that night with just an abundance of grain. And she tells Naomi that, listen, I worked in the field today of this man named Boaz. Well, Naomi suddenly has brand new hope, right? Brand new hope. And really her hope for the future isn't just simply found in what Boaz did, but it really is rooted in who Boaz was. Boaz was a close relative. He was a kinsman redeemer, someone who could redeem. All right, well, as we we end chapter two, we've got new hope, uh, great hope for this story. And so as we head into chapter three, uh, we really, I think, want to remind ourselves here. Listen, the book of Ruth is really not, it's really much more about just the story of three people. It's more about the story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz and really their lives together. This book, and really Ruth chapter three, we see it's a, it's a beautiful picture really of God's grace. It's of God's grace. It is really God's story of how God extends grace to us and really how we are to respond to him, really our ultimate redeemer. Okay, so if the title for Ruth chapter one could be legacy, uh, if the title for Ruth two could be hope, I really think the title for Ruth chapter three is grace. Grace is our title today. So listen, so several months have passed from the end of chapter two to the beginning of chapter three. Right? Ruth has been working in Boaz's field. She's there been gleaning in the harvest uh, all through the barley harvest and then also all through the wheat harvest. So a couple months have, a couple, two, three months have gone by. And I really do believe that these months have been a time of uh, some healing for Naomi. Uh, uh, if you remember when she returned to Bethlehem in chapter one, Naomi came back very broken. Uh, she came back very empty. Naomi had really lost everything and, and she did believe that God was against her. She really believed that God had made her life bitter. But, but with time, I think really think with God's gracious provision uh, through, through, uh, uh, through Boaz's kindness for both her and, and Ruth, I think through the hope of a redeemer, I really, now as we come to chapter three, Naomi and Ruth are ready to take a step here. They really are ready to take a step of, of faith. All right, so let's check it out. Okay, Ruth chapter three, verse one. Here it is. It says, then uh, Naomi, uh, her mother-in-law, said to her, uh, she said to Ruth, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? No, not, not rest in the terms of, hey, Ruth, you need a nap, I think. No, but rest in the sense of, uh, Ruth, I really want security for you. Ruth, I really want a future for you, right? Verse two, she said, is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, is he, uh, see he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. He's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now, there's a couple of like terms here that we may not 
really understand because we don't do a whole lot of threshing and winnowing uh, in our day. I got a few images for you here that might help, but uh, a threshing floor was literally um, kind of a flat rock and it's typically up on a hill. Uh, the goal there is you want to be able to catch the afternoon and the evening breezes as you're doing your work of threshing. Threshing is just simply uh, laying that grain out on a flat, that flat rock and then you, you beat that grain or you run over that grain with a, 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 a sled edge uh, and you, you separate the grain from the stalk. This is threshing. And then winnowing is the exercise of you just take your winnowing fork and you throw that grain up into the air. And as the wind catches it, all the chaff is blown away and what falls back down onto the, onto the rock is the grain, is what you want to gather up. Okay, so threshing, uh, winnowing, this is what's, what's happening here. Uh, there's a lot of references in the Bible to both threshing and, and winnowing, but Hopefully, like, as we get a visual, uh, visual for this, it'll help us kind of really picture what's happening here in the story. So Naomi tells Ruth, listen, tonight Boaz is going to be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. So what's Naomi's plan? We read about it, verse 3. Uh, she says to Ruth, she says, all right, wash, wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but not, do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Okay, so what's going on? So after, I think, a long day of gathering in the harvest and working at the, uh, at the threshing floor, uh, Boaz and his workers, would, they would eat and they would drink and then they would go home. Like, however, uh, Naomi knows that Boaz is gonna stay behind. Boaz would sleep that night at the uh, threshing floor in order to protect his grain from, from any robbers that might come, come along. So she knows that this is really gonna be the perfect time, right, for Ruth to have a private conversation with Boaz uh, there at the threshing floor. She says, look, keep an eye on where he lies down to sleep, and when he lies down to sleep, go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Look at verse five. Uh, Ruth replied, um, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and she did just as her mother-in-law commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Uh, then she came softly and she uncovered his feet and she lay down. And at midnight, the man was startled. Okay, probably, hey, well, my feet are cold. I don't know. Uh, he, he, was, he says he was startled and he turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, he said who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. She said, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Okay, so what, what is Ruth saying? She's saying, she, spread your wings over me. What she's saying is, Boaz, uh, marry me. She said, Boaz, will you, will you marry me? It really is a beautiful um, expression, and, and we don't use it today, but if, if you remember from chapter 2, verse, verse 12, you know, when Boaz said to Ruth, on the very, very first day that he met her, uh, he said to Ruth, he said, May the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take Refuge, you know, Boaz, um, spread your wings over me. It's, the, it's really the same word that's used in chapter three, verse nine, as what Boaz said in chapter two, verse 12. Like, wh what's Ruth saying? She's saying, hey, hey, Boaz, she said, remember uh, that prayer that you prayed for me on the very first day that we met? That prayer that, we were, that the Lord would bless me, like as I come under his wings. Uh, what, what Ruth is saying here really is, hey, Boaz, how about you being the answer to your own prayer? Uh, how about you uh, spreading your wings over me? Boaz, marry me, right, since you are a kinsman a redeemer. So there, there, there are two things that are going on here, okay? There's two things at work uh, that we really need to understand in this book if, if it's gonna make any sense to us at all. And, and really, because Ruth is talking about uh, both of those things in her marriage proposal here to Boaz, and Boaz knows it, right? Boaz understands both of these things. What we have here is we have two laws of God that we read about in the Bible. One is called the law of the Levire, and the other one is called the law of the Goel, okay? So we read about the law of the Levire in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. 
five and six. And here's what it says. It says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, okay, so if one brother dies, he has, he has no heir, he has no uh, inheritance, right? No continuation of the family line. Well, then what do we do? It says, well, then the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside of the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother. That is, his name, uh, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Okay, so um, as a kinsman redeemer, Boaz was one who could marry Ruth and through that marriage could provide uh, an heir to maintain the family line and to maintain the family inheritance of Elimelech and then to his son Malon who had married Ruth, right? Both Elimelech and Malon have, have, have died years before. All right, so that's the law of the Levire, but then there's another thing going on here. That's the law of the Goel. Let's, let's try to understand that. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23. Uh, God said this. God said, let the land not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. Uh, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. Okay, so again, as a kinsman redeemer, Boaz was also one who could buy back the land that Elimelech and Naomi had sold all those years ago when they moved to the land of Moab. Uh, Boaz could buy it, he could redeem it, and he could return it to Ruth. He could return it to Naomi. All right, so listen, Boaz understands all of this, right? He understands both of these things, the law of the Levire and the law of the Goel. He understands what's wrapped up in Ruth's marriage proposal, uh, and his response to Ruth here is in verse 10. Ruth 3.10, Boaz said to Ruth, he said, may you be blessed by the Lord my daughter, for you have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after younger men, whether rich or poor. Uh, a greater kindness, right? This, uh, a greater kindness shown to Naomi by Ruth than the first kindness, which was that, that kindness of commitment and love to her. Listen, Ruth's actions again are a blessing to Naomi. What is this blessing? The blessing of the redemption of the land, uh, the blessing of uh, the raising up of a son, right? To receive that inheritance from her son, Malon. And then also that the family line continues on. Listen, Ruth could have gone after, as Boaz said, younger men. We don't know how old Boaz is. We don't know what the age difference is here. Uh, but it seems that Boaz was a bit older than Ruth. Uh, but and she could have gone after younger men. She could have gone after whoever she wanted, uh, but Ruth chose here to place herself under the authority of the word of God, and she chose herself, she, she chose to trust in the promises of God. Uh, bottom line, bottom line here is Ruth wanted to follow God's word, and she wanted to do it God's way. That's what she's doing. She says, I'm committed. I want to follow God's word, and I want to do it God's uh, way. Verse 11 Verse 11, it says, uh, And now my daughter, Boaz said, Do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Okay, there's, there's that same word again, that worthy, worthy woman. It's that word hyle. We read over there, Boaz was described using this exact same word in chapter two. Boaz was described as a man of hyle, a man of valor, a man of worth. Right? He was a man of noble character and we're reading it about Ruth right now. Ruth is also a woman of Heil, right? She is a woman of noble character. I mean, I love it. Like these two, Boaz and Ruth, they are such a perfect match for each other, aren't they? It's like they're they're just like cut from the from the exact same cloth, aren't they? Uh, these these two, they are just bright lights. Right? Bright lights shining in a very very dark time. Right? The time of the judges when everyone is just doing what is right in their own eye. But here we, we have these two. Right? They're just standing in this really, I think, stark contrast to the culture around them. You know, I, I think it's really worth um, each of us asking, asking the, the, the question, you know, how brightly am I shining in the midst of the culture in which I live today? 
Like how brightly do I shine in, in a culture when it's so often it just simply seems like everyone is doing what is right in his own eyes? You know, is, is all that we care about doing life on our own terms? Is that, do, we, do we just simply care about doing life in our way? Or, or like Ruth and Boaz, do we allow God's word to be our guide? I would ask you simply how important, how important is it uh, to you and to me, right, that we follow God's word, uh, that we do it God's way. And I, I would say, like, trust me, uh, uh, when we do, uh, when we do this, listen, we will stand out. We will stand out. Uh, we will be set apart from our culture. And, and this really shouldn't surprise us, right, because this is, as followers of Christ, this is our uh, this is our calling. It's our calling. Uh, how are we described? We are described in the Bible as salt. Right? Uh, we are described in the Bible as light in the darkness. Uh, we're described as followers of Christ. As uh, We are to be ambassadors for him. Uh, ambassadors for Christ. Like representing Christ in the midst of a foreign land. A foreign place. Uh, what does salt do? I mean salt stands out. So it stands out. Um, it, what does light do? Light, just a little bit of light in the darkness stands out. Like you cannot miss it. Uh, an, an ambassador in a foreign land stands out. So listen, our, our calling is not simply like just be good, like just try to be good people so that you can stand out. That, that's, not the, that's not the calling, that is not the goal. Um, it is really a daily submission for, for followers of Christ. What's our, what's our mission and our call? It's a daily submission, right, to the word of God. Uh, it, is, it is Christ in us, right, changing us by the power of the Holy Spirit, radically altering the way that we live and act and move and minister in the midst of this culture in which God has placed, placed us. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says this, if anyone is in Christ, what is he? The Bible describes it. Paul says here, we are a new creation. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Listen, in Christ, we have been made brand new. We're not, we're not what we were, right? Uh, we're not what we yet will be, but we have become a brand new creation. Uh, the Bible describes it as we pass from death to life, right? Complete transformation by God's grace through faith in Jesus. So listen, when we live that faith in our world, uh, it will, we will stand, we'll stand out. Uh, Boaz and Ruth, they stand out here. It's obvious, why? Well, because they believe the word of God and they're committed to follow the word of God in obedience. How are we doing, you and I? How are we doing? And in the midst of our time and in the midst of our culture, uh, do we believe the word of God? Right, and then do we, day by day, follow it in obedience? Listen to verse 11. It says this, uh, Boaz said, And now my daughter, do not fear. Do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman, and now it is true that I am a redeemer. Okay, then there's a curveball here. He says, but yet, yet there is a redeemer, a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. I'll lie down until the morning. So listen, Boaz, is a, he's a man of his word. And his, again, his desire is to walk in obedience. Listen, we just learned something. Like, we just learned that there's another another relative, a, a closer relative than Boaz, who according to uh, God's word, he has the, uh, the first right of redemption. Okay, there, there's someone else who's a nearer relative. Now look, Bo I, Boaz wants to marry Ruth, right? But, but Boaz does not say, look, I want to marry Ruth and I'm going to do whatever I want. Right? He doesn't say, I want to marry Ruth and I will do it my way. Uh, Boaz here still, as, as a man of noble character, a man of faith who wants to follow God's word, he's saying, I'm gonna trust, right? I'm gonna trust, I wanna do it God's way first. Now listen, I, I gotta say, like, like these, are, these are real people, right, with, with real emotions. Like, I gotta wonder, like, do you think either one of them got any sleep the rest of that night? 
I mean, I, imagine like what must have Ruth been thinking about? What must have been going through Ruth's mind? What must she have been thinking as she's lying there, uh, there at that uh, heap of grain uh, that night at the threshing floor? Like uh, she must have been wondering like what is going to happen? What's gonna happen? Like I want to marry Boaz. I wanna marry him. Uh, I mean, I just asked him to marry me for crying out loud. I mean, I, I, what is she thinking through as she's, as she's lying there? Um, this other near relative, is he going to step in? Is this other near, re- near relative, is he going to, uh, to redeem? And if he does, like, will he love me? Uh, will this other relative, will, be he, will he be a man of love? Will he be a man of noble character like, like Boaz? Uh, how, how in the world is Boaz going to talk to him? Like, I wonder what is Boaz going to say to this other near relative? Like, I, and you, you gotta wonder if Ruth is, uh, is wondering, um, am I gonna be able to have a child anyway? Am I gonna be able to have a child? Uh, she was married to Malon for 10 years, and, and she has no children. Okay, so she, it seems that she is, is barren. Uh, might Ruth be there that night wondering, I mean, is, is any of this going to work? And then think about uh, Boaz. What must be going through Boaz's mind? What's he thinking and what is he feeling? Uh, number one, I think he must be thinking, um, I've just been proposed to. <laughs> okay, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Right? He, he's, been, he, he's been proposed to. I wonder if he's just asking, uh, God, I- is this what you have for me. God, is this what you want me uh, to do? Uh, I, I'm, he's a man, so he's probably thinking strategy, okay? So uh, that's how my brain kind of works sometimes. I sort of think about, okay, what's my next step? And I wonder if he's like working on his strategy for, okay, how am I going to talk to this near relative tomorrow? Like, what am I, what am I going to say to him? How am I going to approach this conversation, this, this one who really does have the first right to redeem? Uh, what, what am I going to do if he says he will redeem? You know, I, I, I don't want to uh, lose Ruth. Am, am I going to lose her? Is that what's going to happen? Uh, he must be wondering, I mean, is any of this going to work? Verse 14. So, so, so Ruth lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. Okay, so it's still dark. And, and he, said, he said to her, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Okay, I think Boaz is just simply interested in protecting I think both of their reputations here. And I, I just want to say, I, just, I do want to be clear, there really is no hint in the scriptures here that anything inappropriate was, is happening here between these two. Uh, the Bible doesn't indicate that there's anything sexual going on. Listen, I think Boaz just simply does not want any wrong idea out in the community. Verse 15, uh, and he said, he said, bring the garment that you're wearing and hold it out. So she held it out and he measured out six measures of barley and he put it on her and then she went back into the city. Okay, don't know exactly how much this is. Probably each measure is probably a sia, which is 10 pounds. So I really think Boaz just heaped the grain on her, about possibly 60 pounds of, of grain for her. Verse 16, and it says, and when Ruth came back to her mother-in-law, her mother-in-law said, how did it go, right? I mean, I wonder, like, did Naomi get any sleep that night either? Probably pacing the floor, what's happening, what's happening, how's it going? As she gets back, okay, how did it go? How did it go, my daughter? And then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, uh, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Okay, I don't know, like, no, Boaz is not a dummy, right? He's not a dummy at all. I think it's a good idea. Got to butter up the future mother-in-law. It's a pretty smart move, bro. I, I agree with that. Uh, but, uh, but, but listen, I really, there's more than that, okay? There, there's more than that, of course. I really think that there's a message here from Boaz. Look, when, when Naomi came back to Bethlehem in chapter one, she said, um, I have come back empty, right? And I really think the message from Boaz here to Naomi is, hey, look, your empty days are over, Naomi. Your empty days are behind you. By God's grace, uh, you will find rest. You will find rest. Verse 18, Naomi replied, she said, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man, he will not rest, uh, but he will settle this matter today. Okay, wait. Ruth, you gotta wait to find out what happens. Okay, so we're, we're kind of left hanging here. We gotta wait. We have to wait. We wonder, like, what in the world is going is going to happen? I would say, like, if this were a uh, if this were a TV show, this would be the perfect place where they would absolutely leave us hanging. So we make sure we have to tune in next week to find out 
what happens. Okay, a bit of a, a bit of a cliffhanger here. I, th- I would say no TV show did that did that better than like the old old school Batman TV show that I used to watch when I was a, was a little kid. I'm not talking about cool like Christian Bale Batman. I'm talking about old school like Adam West, <laughs> old Adam West Batman. Uh, you remember him? I don't know. Uh, um, not exactly what I would call uh, a fit. I always thought it was kind of funny that Batman had a little bit of a tummy on him, a little bit of a belly. But anyway, that, that old school Batman show would always like end the same way. It would always end with this perilous moment like Batman has been captured and he's in sort of a deadly trap that's been set by the Joker. Like these knives are swirling around and he's tied to a conveyor belt heading into them. And you know the narrator would come on at the end of the show and the narrator would say something, uh, something like this. The narrator would say, uh, like, like, will Batman be cut to pieces by the joker's web of knives or whatever like is this the end of the cape crusader and he'd always say this he would say tune in next week and he would say same bat time same bat channel all right same thing so like ruth ruth chapter three is really kind of leaving us in this moment like wait like find we'll find out what is going to happen that's where the story leaves us we've got to wait and we got to wonder we wonder and now uh, today church I would just simply uh, say this, listen, uh, the church, the bride of Christ, uh, we are also, in a sense, uh, we're waiting today. Christ's church is, in a sense, waiting. Now, we're not waiting for our Redeemer. Uh, Our Redeemer has come uh, for all those who have their faith in Jesus Christ, that Redeemer, he's, he's come. Our redemption has been accomplished right through the work of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his shed blood on the cross on our behalf. Like Jesus is our kinsman Redeemer and, and his grace has been poured out on us. Uh, but we do wait, church, like we do wait in anticipation of that day when our faith will be sight. Uh, one day our faith will be sight. Uh, one day uh, we wait until we s- will see the Lord face to face. Yeah, and that will come. That will come either when we uh, are, um, are uh, when we pass through death, right? We pass through death and we enter into His presence in glory, or when Christ returns for His for His own. You know, today, like Ruth, uh, we wait. Right? Uh, we wait by faith because we believe in all of the promises of our Redeemer. Uh, All that our Redeemer said he will do, uh, he will do. And so like while we wait, while we wait, uh, the Lord has given us a gift. The Lord has given us a gift. It's it's a command that Jesus gave to his followers that we would always remember. Like remember through the Lord's Supper, right, the redemption that is ours by his grace and really the expectant hope that he is coming again. Uh, there, are, there are two elements when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Think of this. This is Christ's reminder for us of, of who he is and what he's done. Two elements, there's the bread and there's the cup as we observe communion uh, together when we, when we gather. The bread represents the body of Christ. Like, think of it. Think of it in this context of our kinsman redeemer and, and how that connects with the Lord's Supper. You know, J- Jesus himself, uh, God himself, the Son of God, he took on flesh. Uh, God became man. He was fully God and he was fully man. What did Jesus do as he came? He became uh, a kinsman of ours. He took on humanity, fully God, fully man. He's our kinsman. Like he came that he might die. The cup represents the blood of Christ which was shed for us. Listen, Jesus not only is our kinsman, Jesus is also our redeemer. He's our redeemer. Uh, Remember that, that definition of redeem? is to buy back by paying a price. What was the price that was paid for our redemption? It was the shed blood of Christ. Like he laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin. Why? Well, because the Bible just tells us that the wages for sin is death, is death. Uh, But Jesus Christ took that penalty for sin upon himself. You know, like Naomi and Ruth, in our sin, we really are the helpless ones. Like we are in desperate need of one who will show us uh, grace. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ has done. Right? He died in our place. Forgiveness for sin, it's available to us, every one of us, if we will place our faith in Jesus Christ, you know, trusting in his saving work alone. Listen, so every time that we observe the Lord's Supper together, uh, as a church, what are we doing? Right? We are reflecting on this grace that's been poured out given to us by our kinsman redeemer. 
uh, Jesus on his final night with the disciples before he went to the cross, uh, this is what he did. He gathered them around that table and he shared the elements with them. He began this anew. And, and every time we do Lord's Supper together, we read these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he is our kinsman. Right? And the scripture goes on. It says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And he is our redeemer. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right? So listen, just like Ruth, we wait for our redeemer to come. Uh, Jesus came, right? He bought our redemption with his life and he will come again. So listen, by faith, we proclaim this truth. Listen, every time that we gather as his people around the communion table, um, our Redeemer will come and we will celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb together with him in glory. Like, so while we wait, listen, we have this message of hope to share with the world. Like, while we wait for our Redeemer to return, we've got this message like this glorious good news of the gospel that the world just desperately needs to hear. Look, as for the, Ruth of, uh, as for the story of Ruth, we're gonna have to uh, tune in next week and join us to get the final story. So listen, I'm sorry, nobody's allowed to uh, skip church next week, so you gotta either come back and join us online as you've done, or you could join us in person. Uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. Chapter four is absolutely the culmination of the entire, entire book. We have much to learn next week as we see the fulfillment of the promises of our Redeemer. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we, we worship you today. God, we worship you as our kinsman, Lord God, and as our Redeemer. Uh, thank you, God, for sending the Son into this world who has laid down his life, paid the price of redemption for us. God, would you open up our eyes and, and draw our hearts to faith, not in ourselves, faith not in our own goodness, but faith in in our Redeemer. Uh, Lord Jesus, God, would you, uh, by your grace, where our hearts are hard, God, would you soften? God, where, where our minds are closed, would you reveal to us this glorious good news that the price for sin has been paid, eternal life is available through the gift of the Son. So Jesus, we worship you this morning. It is in your name. Amen. Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand songs to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Cry!
I won't bow to idols I'll stand strong and worship you If it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be born by feelings I hold fast to what's true If the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway Into resurrection life If I join you in your sufferings Then I'll join you in your eyes And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My song will be the same Thank you for leading us this morning. Uh, church, stay connected with us through our website, gracepointenc.org. And also let us know ways that we can be praying for you. Reach out to us at prayer at gracepointenc.org. It's a wonderful way for us to stay connected uh, during a time of online church. So uh, thanks so much again for uh, joining us, worshiping with us today uh, online. We have a wonderful holiday weekend. We just close with a word of benediction. Uh, now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all men, strengthen the faint heart, support the weak, help the suffering, and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all. God bless you. Suddenly articulate with a thousand songs to lift one cry, then from north to south and east. Christ be magnified. Were the